Um, good morning, everyone. So, or good afternoon, sorry. I, I, I think we have most everybody here is on the East Coast. Uh, I think we have a pretty good overlap with the folks that joined us for our morning session, but if you're just joining us, welcome uh, to the, what is the second of a two-part series on uh, biomedical engineering and biomechanics in our, our virtual summer ca engineering camp. Um, they, uh, th this afternoon session is designed to be standalone if you're just joining us. So it is, uh, so we, we uh, even if you're just joining us, you'll, you'll be able to just jump right in with us. Just wanna uh, obviously say welcome. Um, there's three faculty here, uh, Professor Donna Evanstein, uh, Eric Kennedy, myself, and then uh, Ben Wheatley from Mechanical Engineering. We'll offer a brief introduction. In the morning session, we actually offered a, um, a bit of a technical uh, introduction to ourselves and, 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 uh, and what, we re what our area of research is. Uh, this, this afternoon, we thought we'd just offer a bit more of a personal introduction, so I'll let Dr. Evanstein get started. So as I talked about this morning, my research area is biomaterials and nanomechanics, but I came to this uh, kind of endpoint by an interesting path. So when I was an undergrad, there weren't that many undergrad BME programs. So I actually started out as an environmental engineer and changed a couple times. And sophomore year, I decided I wanted to do biomed, but the school I went to didn't have biomedical engineering. So I double majored in biology and engineering and applied science, which was kind of a general mechanical engineering type degree. And then in grad school, I specialized in biomedical engineering and got into biomaterials research, and that's how I wound up on this path. Um, I already talked a bit about my research uh, interests, which is the nanoindentation, biomimetics, and also fabrication. You can see in the image in the lower left corner, I took some sculpture classes during my sabbatical because I teach a fabrication class and I'm interested in different ways of making things. My other hobbies, uh, especially during COVID, we've been doing a lot of baking and reading and listening to show tunes. We've been to watch a lot of TV shows with my family. Uh, you can see them there in the pictures. That was a trip to Ireland a few years ago. My daughter Clara is now 11 and Thomas is nine. We really like Star Wars and Marvel and Disney. So we've been watching a lot of Disney Plus. We're looking forward to Hamilton uh, tomorrow. And uh, I do a lot of outdoor running, biking, walking, and spend a lot of time distracting my kids from screens. And uh, I'm also really interested in global education opportunities for students. And my name again is Eric Kennedy. I'm a faculty member in biomedical engineering along with Dr. Ebenstein. Um, I, uh, I went to the University of Maryland undergrad, um, and, uh, and then I actually worked for a number of years and then went back to graduate school at Virginia Tech. Uh, so if there are folks from Maryland and Virginia, I, I hit some of your, your favorite schools, I hope. Um, and uh, see, so my as I overviewed this morning, I, a lot of what I do is in injury prevention and safety research. Um, and specifically now, I like to do a lot with uh, child uh, uh, injury prevention, specifically on playgrounds. Um, and, uh, and so just by way of me, um, I think most people, uh, if you know me, it doesn't take long to realize that I'm really into cars. Um, and so even the pictures of my kids in this, uh, that's my daughter and I going for a ride in our 1988 car, a um, uh, little throwback Honda. And then uh, my son's riding around there in his, uh, his power wheels, which uh, I picked up on Craigslist so that we could actually throw all the all the stuff away from the inside and soup it up. So he's got a hot rodded power wheels that he can actually do donuts and stuff in. Um, so in addition to that, I do a lot of running and cycling. Um, I, uh, in a normal world, would be playing a lot of baseball with my kids um, as their coach, but not so much this summer. Um, and just generally, I think I use a lot of my engineering skills to fix stuff a lot of the time. So I'll hand it over to Professor Wheatley. Hey everyone, again, my name is Ben Wheatley. I'm in mechanical engineering. <clears throat> um, as I said in the previous section, my expertise is in uh, tissue biomechanics and musculoskeletal soft tissues like uh, skeletal muscle. Um, I, on a more personal level, I uh, do a lot of running. I do a lot of trail running. I do a lot of road running, uh, some running on the track um, and other activity, out, outdoor activities as well. Um, I ran track and cross country in high school and in college. Um, and so this picture in the middle top there is for me last summer uh, running a 30K out in uh, California. Um, my wife and I also work tirelessly restoring our old house in Lewisburg. Um, you can usually find me on a given uh, weekend 
out either mowing the lawn or working on the landscape or scraping something off the house or painting something or moving in and out so that, um, that that's a nice place to find me on weekends where I often see people going by in town. Um, and then we also really enjoy just snuggling up on the couch with our two dogs that are shown there on the top. Uh, Towser with a T is the one on the left. He's um, a poodle uh, Cocker Spaniel mix. And Fenway, the black and white one on the right, is some type of mix. We have no idea what he is. Um, and um, so I also like engaging in, in outreach, um, which is why we're here today. And there's an image of me uh, presenting on some muscle mechanics on the bottom there uh, at the Lewisburg Children's Museum last summer. So we introduced in the morning session biomedical engineering, um, but I'm actually in mechanical engineering, so we wanted to talk a little bit about mechanical engineering and maybe some of the similarities and differences. So mechanical engineering or mechanical engineers learn to apply math and science to develop innovative solutions to important real world problems. And really with mechanics, the emphasis here um, is on machines or uh, mechanical content applied to machines. Um, so, for example, there's an image on the top left that's maybe more so of what might be like a traditional mechanical engineering machine. Um, so that's part of a turbine that's being manufactured. Um, other areas that fall under mechanical engineering are aerospace or um, renewable energy, obviously biomechanics, robotics. And so really anything that, that involves some type of machine, uh, some type of problem that can be solved with a, mach a machine or some type of um, new machine that can be designed to, to solve some problem is, is how we characterize mechanical engineering. So then I want to ask the question of what is a machine? And I really emphasize that it's more than some rigid powered piece of equipment. So the image on the left, which is a little bit uh, hidden behind my emphasis uh, text there, is what we might traditionally think of as a machine. There's belts and drive shafts and a lot of metal and other you know, gears and other materials. Um, but a lot of emerging areas in mechanical engineering are, I think, emphasize different types of machines. So the image in the middle on the top is a, um, is a soft robot, a completely isolated soft robot that um, actually reproduces some of the motions of um, of an octopus shown in the bottom there. And so this is an area where mechanical engineers can design and fabricate um, robotics, completely soft robots um, that might be very different than what would be a traditional machine. And then obviously we've spent a lot of time talking about biomechanics and prosthetic, um, prosthetic limbs in the first session. And um, my work is really focusing on modeling, understanding, um, trying to better characterize the human body as a machine. And so I would encourage you to rethink what a machine is and that you are all machines. I actually run an Engineering 100 uh, seminar, which is our intro to engineering class here at Bucknell. Um, and my seminar is entitled, You Are a Machine. And, and it's an introduction to biomechanics. So um, now might be a good time if, if you wanna put into the group chat, different examples of machines, um, particularly machines that you wouldn't necessarily initially think um, would fall under mechanical engineering outside of, of some um, sort of geared object. Um, so feel free to put those in and maybe I'll read off a few as we go along. Um, but otherwise we can maybe slip to the next slide. So in mechanical engineering here at Bucknell then we have quite a um, diverse set of expertise. We have individuals that are working on safer, more efficient um, aeronautical and automotive systems. We have faculty who are uh, trying to develop cleaner, more sustainable energy. Um, we have faculty who are designing and developing new and stronger materials. And we have faculty who are working to improve better health, better global health. And so what I want to emphasize is just like biomedical engineering is very diverse in the um, the skills that many biomedical engineers have, mechanical engineering is very diverse in the problems that we, that we tackle. Um, so I'm gonna uh, jump in now and, and transition. We 
Professor Wheatley you know, talked about the, the breadth of mechanical engineering. And, and biomechanics is a field that is, is really sits at an intersection in particular, I think, of biomedical engineering and mechanical engineering. And I didn't say this in my intro, but my undergraduate degree, as well as my master's, were both in mechanical engineering before I got my PhD in biomedical engineering, just to show how close those two fields are. Um, and biomechanics can be a field that actually then in this, it, it's drawing people with backgrounds in mechanical or biomedical engineering, but it's also a field that's very diverse um, in and of itself. And so things happen at the micro scale uh, where we're actually looking at kind of the, the, the molecular, uh, chemical and structural uh, uh, layout of materials and then trying to, uh, to determine how those interactions then create the uh, uh, to help help to uh, provide the uh, the material properties that we see on the larger scale. Uh, so Dr. Ebenstein does a lot of micro scale biomechanics. Um, I myself I'm interested in injury prevention, so I look at the human body as a complete structure, and then at what point does loading within our world around us actually uh, contribute to injury happening. So I look at the human, the whole body of the, of the human body and look at what injury happens. And then Professor Wheatley kind of looks in the middle at the macro scale oscillating back and forth between the full body biomechanics and motion and micro scale and what are the material properties of the different tissues within the body. Uh, this afternoon, we wanted to, to really feature in particular um, uh, motion capture is, is kind of the, the area of interest within biomechanics. And so we have a, a lab within our facilities here at Bucknell that's a motion capture lab. It's a relatively large space um, with a lot of cameras. And I wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about the setup of this space and how it's used to, to collect information on, on the human body. If you saw our preview from before, you saw um, our, we have a we have we saw the video of the cyclist. I don't think I showed you uh, this video. Um, so this is actually what it looks like if we capture the video um, of her uh, riding the bike on our motion capture system, and uh, you can actually see uh, that we can uh, we can rotate around. You can zoom in, so you have full spatial uh, awareness as to what happened when you when you collected this uh, information, and you can look from a variety of different angles. Uh, this is actually a, a pro cyclist, uh, Kelly Catali, um, and she is a Bucknell uh, biomedical engineering alumni. She's a pro women cyclist in the mountain bike uh, race series. Um, she uh, um, also works as a biomedical engineer. Um, and actually, for those of you who were in our morning session and saw the discussion about the DECA arm, she, uh, one, her, one of her first jobs outside of Bucknell was actually working at DECA. Um, as an ergonomics uh, engineer. So she worked not specifically on that particular project, but she worked at the same company that made that device. Um, she was able to come into our lab and we actually uh, outfitted her with the Vicon uh, markers and had her ride her bike. Um, and one of the things she was interested in looking at was actually her pedaling technique uh, because she had actually been working with her coach to refine her pedaling technique to get more efficiency as she rode. So it was a cool thing she was able to verify uh, when she was uh, in our lab. So let me talk a little bit about 3D motion capture and how the system works. Some of you might be familiar with this, but others of you, um, you you're either might be really interested in it or just haven't, uh, haven't seen actually how the system works in, in itself. So uh, let me turn on my pointer here. So we have this large room. It's a large room because we actually want to study locomotion and people moving. So it's a really big space. In fact, we sometimes jokingly refer to it as a gymnasium. If you look around the room, you'll see a whole bunch of cameras oriented around uh, the outskirts of this, this lab. There's 12 cameras in all. Each of these cameras are actually calibrated to allow you to visualize what's going on in this space. So these actually record, they're infrared cameras. So they actually record a response from specific markers that we put on the body. And then you put them at specific uh, points of interest, joints. Um, and, uh, and then we allow the subject to move freely in this space and then we capture all this information. So here's what the markers look like. They're very small. They're, uh, they're probably about the size, uh, roughly I, I generally say they're like a piece of popcorn, right? So you can imagine you pick up one piece of popcorn, that's about how big this thing is. You take these markers, you put them all over your body. Uh, you typically wanna wear some dark non-reflective um, uh, clothing uh, that's tight fitting obviously, so it fits uh, close to your joints. 
uh, we mark our uh, subject up, um, and then you're ready to capture uh, what's, what's going on within that space. So here is kind of situationally how this works. These cameras um, each are taking their own picture of what's going on. So none of these cameras do anything more than what your traditional iPhone, uh, Android camera are recording. They're just, they're just taking a photograph from one perspective. But the fact that we have 12 of these cameras all around the system, then they're calibrated that allow us to see an XYZ coordinate system within the room. And then you can track a, a given marker and and basically what it spits out is it's going to give you uh, the coordinates in millimeters of exactly where that marker is positioned in the room. And notice that I wrote this with a decimal place here. Um, we get sub millimeter resolution to each of these markers. Um, so it's going to spit out that this, this marker is at 556.7 millimeters. And there's obviously uh, there's really high resolution with this system to, uh, to locate exactly where each one of these markers are. Um, and so, uh, and then I'll just point out, and I'll show you an example of this later, but this is actually the position of the marker at one point in time. We're taking about 100 frames per second, and you're probably doing an activity for several seconds, if not longer. So you end up with, let's say you have 50 markers, you're going to get three coordinates for each marker 100 times a second for as many seconds as you record data. So you get an inordinate amount of data out of the system that we then need to analyze. Um, in order to get the cameras calibrated, you have to calibrate the room. So each camera, as I mentioned, is taking just a picture of what it sees, just like a traditional camera. So we have to let them know, we have to let the system know spatially where it is relative to each of the other cameras. It requires a highly trained, highly competent person to calibrate the system, as you can see here. Um, so it takes, a, this is my five-year-old uh, calibrating the system. But so you take this wand and you wave the wand around and you'll notice that the wand actually has uh, different uh, LEDs that are showing up. And, uh, and then those are picked up by the cameras. And then if you do this waving enough, it will allow the system to see where each camera is relative to all the other cameras, because it knows that it's looking for a T um, of these LEDs, and then it can relate each one of them to the, next, uh, to the next camera. And so if you do this calibration, you end up getting a virtual environment that looks like this, where the system has figured out where each of the 12 cameras are, relative to each other and what that looks like in that space. So here you can see, I hope you can visualize that this is actually uh, our alumnus, uh, Kelly, sitting on her bike riding in the lab. Um, some applications of this motion capture system then, so you can take a subject and you put them in, you marker them up. This is actually from my class in the fall. Um, and uh, so we have a student on an ERG machine and, uh, and this particular subject happened to be on the, on the women's crew team here at Bucknell. And we are interested in measuring their hip angle and their knee angle, as well as the coordinates of their hand as they actually went through the process of rowing on the ERG machine. And, uh, and so we do that and we get a, the Vicon capture of this um, and, uh, and it spits out with the image of where all their markers are and allows us to draw a stick figure that replicates the person. I mentioned inordinate numbers of data, amounts of data. So this is actually what I have highlighted here in gray is this is just one marker. That's one marker's uh, series of data. And I'm just gonna point out that this is, uh, this is row 90,615 in our Excel data sheet, right? There are inordinate amounts of data that come out of this Vicon system to allow us to generate things that look like this. So this is actually the video of the student rowing. And then what you see on the right hand side is actually uh, the, the top is uh, the hip angle. So this is the angle of the hip as she goes through the process of rowing. And there's three different lines here because there are three different levels of drag or resistance on the ERG machine. And then the bottom here is actually showing the position of her hands as she goes through the cycle of rowing uh, one cycle after another. And you can probably imagine that if you're uh, trying to competitively row, you're, uh, you're, the idea is that you want to be as consistent from one stroke to the next in your uh, rowing cadence. And so then she's able to use this information to gather 
and some insight into how effectively she can, uh, how efficiently she can actually row on the machine. So that's just one application of some 3D motion capture. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Professor Wheatley. Okay, so <clears throat> thanks, Professor Kennedy. We're going to do an activity now um, where we're going to show some videos and we're going to talk about um, motion capture data and we're really going to focus um, on a knee angle. Okay, so we have different examples uh, that Professor Kennedy showed of hip angle and hand motion. Um, but we're going to move forward now looking at knee angle during various activities. So here's a screenshot of uh, actually me in the lab. And you can see, again, I have the motion capture markers uh, placed on different uh, locations on my leg. So <clears throat> this shot here, my knee angle is somewhere around 100 degrees or so. We can say it's greater, greater than 90 degrees. Um, so if my leg were to be straight, the knee angle would, be, would then be zero degrees. And so as we see, we're gonna have a bunch of um, different data from different activities, and we're gonna be matching up the activities to those data. So here's an example of me walking in the lab. We'll just start out with this very simple example. And again, you can see the motion capture markers are there. Now we're gonna slow down. We're gonna watch it at half speed. And so keep an eye on my left knee there. You can see it bends as my leg is in what's called the swing phase. So when I pull my leg up off the ground, that knee angle changes throughout that swing phase. And then I put my foot back on the ground again and it remains uh, fairly constant. <clears throat> so we can see that we have that associated motion and now we can plot as a function of time, the knee angle uh, throughout that what stance and swing, which is part of this gait phase. So we can see on the graph I've showed at the beginning where my foot first touches the ground, we have relatively low knee angles. And then during that swing phase, when I pull my leg off the ground, that knee angle increases, right? So now we're starting to develop some correlation between the video, the motion that we see in the video, and actually the data that we can output uh, from this motion capture system. So then similarly, we can see these, this sort of skeleton that we get in the Vicon software, in the motion capture software during this movement. So again, we can see uh, that my left leg here is red now. You can see me walking across the floor and the cameras again are picking up those, the locations of the markers and it's able to essentially create a skeleton of my motion. And from that, we can calculate um, different metrics. Again, we're just focusing on that, that left knee angle. <clears throat> okay, so that's, I think, a really simple introduction into, um, you know, how we go all the way from having a, somebody in the gate lab doing various movements down to some type of measurable data or, or measurable information about their movement. So now we want to look at different types of movements and maybe do a bit of an activity uh, where we try and match the data to the actual motions. So there are three graphs shown on the right that again have knee angle as a function of time. So knee angle during whatever movement um, I'm performing in the gate lab. And there are three other activities that we're going to watch videos for. And those specific activities are walking except with a limp. So I'm walking and I'm, I'm not able to um, walk in the same way, perhaps because of some injury, um, and so I have a limp. Uh, the second activity is lunges, and then the third is skipping. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna go through and we'll show all of the videos, and we're gonna keep those graphs up there on the right. And then after we've taken a look at all three of the videos of me in the gate lab, we're gonna uh, have you guess which is which. So before we dive right into those videos, I want to uh, highlight that the, the first data point on the graph, so the, the time zero on each of the graphs is when the left foot first touches the ground, and that's going to show one full cycle, right? So for normal walking, it was when the left foot first touched the ground, and then um, following that stance phase when the left foot swings out and it's in the air and then touches the ground again. So that would be one full cycle. So let's go ahead um, and look before we 
go to the videos at the graphs a little more closely. And um, I want us to try to figure out or try to identify what's unique about each of these graphs so that when we're looking at the videos, we can, um, we can sort of try to correlate and, and, and match these up. So go ahead and type into the chat what you think is unique about each of the graphs. Let's start first with A. So what is it about graph A, that curve there that jumps out at you that you think is noteworthy, um, that has some type of unique aspect to it that's gonna help us identify the video? So go ahead and put into the chat what you think is unique about graph A. And I'll read some of them out. Um, and then we, we have a little bit of a, a sort of summary that we put together for each graph as well. <clears throat> so I see there's a large spike at the very end of the graph. That's great. So there's a large change in the angles, uh, particularly uh, towards the end. Um, maybe some lower values and then a, that large climb, right, at 1.25 seconds. So that's, that's great. So I think maybe we can go to the next slide and see how well that corresponds to what we had already. So we had identified, the three of us, that there was this big peak here, which means lots of flexion of the knee towards the end. And that, that really matches up with what I see in the chat. So that's great. Good job, every, everyone. Um, so now let's move on to graph Graph B, what do we think is unique about graph B? What are the features about graph B that stand out? Um, we can note here that the y-axes are all the same. So they're all plotted on the same minus 20 to 140 degrees. So great, so very little flexion, um, some negative knee angles. That's great, yep. So very small angle change, um, a little range and just that one spike. Great, so I see a lot of consistency in terms of what people are putting into the chat there, uh, which is great. So maybe we could go on to the next slide and see what, what we had. So again, we had very, uh, very low values, very little knee flexion um, overall. And um, it looked, we, we identified that before it looked uh, pretty similar to, to uh, the, the walking that we had, um, we had plotted previously. Great, so what about graph C? What's our final observation? Um, what are our final observations about graph C? So, so go ahead and describe in the chat, what are some unique features of graph C? Hilly, I like that. <laughs> yeah, three, three large peaks, three large spikes, right? So three, three large uh, flexes there, good, many spikes. Yeah, it uh, decrease every time. So with each spike that comes up, it comes back down. So that's great. Um, all right, so what did we have for our summary? Right, so three peaks show that the knee flex three different times uh, throughout throughout the phase. So that's that's great. Yep, and, and no negative angles for that as well. So we have positive flexion the whole time. Great, that was a lot of activity in the chat. So let's go ahead and look at our three activities now. We're going to don't put into the chat yet. We're gonna do um, we're gonna do a poll at the end. So don't do any don't do any guessing yet. Maybe you can take some notes on your own or start to formulate it in 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 your head. But don't don't put anything into the chat yet about which you think is which. Uh, we're gonna watch all three of the videos and then we'll we'll deliver a poll. So here's the first video. This is limping. So again, we're gonna show it just like for the walking. We're gonna show it um, normal speed and then twice twice at half speed. So, so just hold off on guessing which you think it is. Don't put anything in the chat. We're, again, we're going to launch a poll. Uh, we're going to launch a poll in a minute. And so here's once more uh, limping at half speed. All right. So that was that was limping. Now we're going to move on to uh, lunges. So here are lunges at full speed. You can see I have my Bucknell shirt on for this. <laughs> okay, here are lunges at half speed now, so slow down. 
I'm going to uh, resist my urge to talk too much about <laughs> these activities. My the teacher in me wants to talk about them, but I'm going <laughs> to let you all watch and, and formulate uh, your own opinions and your own thoughts. So one more time, this is lunges. Lunges at half speed. <laughs> All right. And then finally we have skipping. So here's our video for skipping. I apologize, I skipped a little bit out of frame in a couple of these, but I must have had a cup of coffee before or something. So there's skipping. And skipping at half speed. So again, keep an eye on that left knee. That's the angle that we're measuring. All right, so those are the three videos. I'm now gonna launch the poll, so you should see the poll. So go ahead and type into the poll which you think activity lines up with each graph. So for graph A, do you think it's limping, lunging, or skipping? For B, do you think it's limping, lunging, or skipping? And for C, do you think it's limping, lunging, or skipping? <clears throat> so we have maybe around half or so. A lot of people are voting now, so. Give another maybe 20 seconds or so to get those final votes in. We're almost all done. Anyone who hasn't voted, I'll close it in about 10 seconds. So get those, get those final votes in while you can. All right, I'm gonna close it in five, Four, three, two, one. All right, so I'm gonna share the results now and I think, can everyone see that? All right, so we see that uh, for graph A, the overwhelming majority, 60% of you said that that was skipping and I can report that that is correct. So most people uh, predicted that one correctly. I will say that that was a tough one. I think skipping um, was a little bit difficult, certainly out of the three um, in terms of predicting that. Uh, for plot B, uh, almost or over three quarters of you predicted that to be uh, limping and that was correct. And then uh, graph C, that leaves uh, lunges. And so what we saw overall was that, you know, for graph A, we had that high peak at the end when the knee is really being uh, driven upwards during skipping. Uh, for graph B, we had really low angles, low knee angles as a result of that limping motion. And graph C, we had uh, those three, three large peaks from the lunging activity. So now we can go ahead and look at what uh, we actually see in the Vicon software as well, just as we saw during walking. And if we keep an eye on that left leg, which again is red, we can see there's very low, uh, very low uh, knee flexion angles and actually negative angles as we pointed out previously. So again, this is something that the software can do real time. So while we're actually in the lab uh, collecting data, we can, we can uh, visually uh, reproduce this motion, uh, this sort of skeleton uh, within the software. And here are the lunges. So again, those lunges have those big three peaks. So there's another peak and then there's another peak. So that, that knee is flexing quite a lot throughout that motion during and those I, lunges. I just want to emphasize again, if you're watching this, I think there's like, there's three, maybe four lunges that's, that happen within the frame of Vicon. 
But what you're looking at on the graph is, correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Wheatley, but that's just one cycle. So that is one step from the time the left, hand, left foot hits till the time the left foot hits again. Right, exactly. So one full cycle, one full uh, repeating cycle there. Mm -hmm. and, then. and then finally, here's skipping. I really like skipping. I think it's cool to see the, the, the skeleton sort of skip up in the air. So again, if you follow that left knee, when it first touches, it sort of drags along the ground. And then as it goes up in the air, there's that high flexion. So I think it um, overall, that was great. I think we had a lot of um, correct responses. Hopefully um, we see now that the connection between uh, measuring human motion in the lab and um, data that we actually can collect and, and quantify um, and plot as we see here, these, these knee angles. So now I think we wanna move on to some applications of motion capture. Okay, so um, this is a, got a quick picture of my, this is my daughter uh, who's now nine um, and she, she finds it humorous to sometimes get the, um, get markered up and get into the lab uh, to see herself on the screen. So you can barely probably make out, but you can see a little stick figure of her actually on the, uh, on the screen there that she can watch herself as she uh, thinks she was practicing for the nutcracker uh, when in this particular thing. Um, but uh, in addition to practicing for the nutcracker, uh, you can do quite a bit more and, and walking, skipping and lunging in the lab, you can do quite a bit more with motion capture. And so uh, grab the chat window and, and, uh, and if you have any thoughts on things that you can do with a motion capture system, whether they're medically related or not, drop them in the chat and then, uh, and then we can, let me actually pull up the window so I can see what's coming in here. Yeah. yeah, we see uh, Yeah, go ahead, Professor everything Wilson. from uh, video games and uh, computer generated characters in movies. So we had talked before there um, when we were putting together these slides, an example is uh, for anyone who's seen The Hobbit. So Smog, the dragon in The Hobbit is actually Benedict Cumberbatch is face animated um, due to motion capture. So I think that's kind of a neat example of motion capture. Um, I see uh, view the range of motion after an injury. So that's, that's a great clinical application, uh, health related application of motion capture. Exactly. So just like we saw in that sort of limping example, um, we can, we can identify with this technology, how people um, perform before and after um, maybe surgery or are affected by injury. I see sports animations for games is, is a really popular thing, if, especially with the the lifelike realism that they try and build into different games right now. So if you're a baseball fan and you want to get MLB the show 20 and you want to actually see what each player looks like in their unique batting stance or their unique way that they swing, um, they actually will take players during spring training and uh, bring the Vicon system around to spring training facilities and, ha and record the players with motion capture markers on them so that they can build a library of each of these individuals. And then uh, when they're developing the game throughout the year to launch the next year, they actually have, uh, they can build the model around uh, the actual Vicon character of the particular player. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and yeah. building off of that, I see optimal motion for sports in there. So for example, um, pitchers who in baseball who might have an injury that could be caused by some biomechanics breakdown in their, um, in their mechanics, the motion capture is a great way to be able to quantify things like joint angles, shoulder um, orientation, shoulder angles during pitching uh, for individuals and, and maybe make recommendations that um, athletes, you know, alter their angle of their elbow arm delivery or, or, or something along, along those lines. So I'm going to jump ahead to the next slide, which actually dovetails more into the specific applications within the medical field. <clears throat> and then Professor Wheatley can talk a little bit about a project that he's got going on right now with the orthopedics department at Geisinger. But 
uh, 3D motion capture is used in, in a lot of, um, uh, in particular, rehabilitation settings within healthcare, uh, but it can also be used uh, not only post-operatively, but also pre-operatively. So you can actually look at patients. Um, in particular, let's say you have a, a, a patient with cerebral palsy, and we have a video that we can show you later um, about that, but actually looking at uh, maybe the, the uh, gait and motion of a particular patient and how they move, and then maybe plan, um, use that data to actually help plan a surgical intervention to actually see if you can relate the muscle insertion points, for example, or the muscle lengths in a given patient to the way that they move. And if you can cause a, if you can correlate those two things, then you can more effectively understand what the outcome would be if you were to, say, relocate that muscle insertion um, to allow the muscle length or <clears throat> to lengthen, for example, and allow that patient to perhaps walk more upright, et cetera. You can use it to characterize gait and motion for a, a subject that's uh, just been withstood a trauma surgery. Uh, we'd already talked about athletics, not, not the video game setting, but what Professor Wheatley was suggesting in terms of uh, repetitive motion or, or even uh, perhaps optimizing your motion so that uh, you can, you can uh, really take full advantage of, of your body. In fact, I'll mention we, uh, we have an alumnus now who graduated um, and went on to, uh, I think it, she's at University of California, San Diego, um, and is actually working in a, in a sports biomechanics lab where they work with Olympic, uh, U.S. Olympic uh, athletes to optimize their, uh, their hurdling and their launches out of the, out of the uh, gates and in, in, in track and field events, et cetera. So, um, and, then, uh, and then there's plenty of other uses which we haven't even, uh, won't, we don't even have time to get into. But I think I'll turn it over to Professor Wheatley to talk a little bit about what he's, he's working on with, uh, with Mark Seeley over at Geisinger. Yeah, so this is a project that I'm working on with a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Geisinger, which is around 15, 20 minutes down the road here in Danville. Um, so he is, uh, as I said, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Um, so he works with a lot of uh, pediatric patients who have pain from a range of different conditions. And one of those is called femoral aniversion, or essentially a twisting of the femur or the thigh bone. And so I've sort of shown that um, in the middle left there with what we would uh, refer to as a typically developing uh, lower limb morphology or lower limb shape and then femoral aniversion, which is sort of that twisting of the thigh bone and that results in uh, severe toe in gait and can cause uh, severe knee pain as well. And so what we're doing is with the video on the right is uh, we're actually modeling a typically developing gait or a gait in people who do not have this uh, severe knee pain due to this twisting as well as gait or walking in people uh, who do have this condition. And, and what we're trying to do is better understand why these individuals have pain, um, how, their, how their joints um, are loaded mechanically because of the way that their, their bones are shaped um, and because of their, their uh, walking motion. And so you can see that uh, video was of um, a typically developing gait pattern and this is a gait in someone with femoral aniversion. So you can see the toes point inwards and the, the kneecap or the patella points inwards as well. And you can imagine that that, that can be very painful uh, for these individuals. And he'll actually go in in surgery and transect the femur. So cut through the femur and rotate it and, and change the alignment of the bones. But it's, it's very difficult to know how to do that for each individual. And so we're trying to use computer modeling um, and gait analysis to better understand how to actually perform these surgeries. So on the bottom left, we can see actually this is contact pressure um, for the kneecap or for the patella and you can see uh, the image on the left versus on the right shows that uh, with that twisting of the thigh bone we get higher contact pressure so there's there's more pressure in the joint there's there's more pain in those individuals and so this is just an example of how we can use um, everything from motion capture to tissue level biomechanics uh, to work with clinicians and to improve health So now we have um, just a sort of send off video that we thought was a really great summary of sort of human uh, level biomechanics uh, that uses a particular type of software uh, for many different applications. And so we thought this would be uh, a really neat overall view of, of how, um, 
how these uh, engineering tools can be used to better health. How do sprinters run so fast? How do we use our muscles to recover from a fall? Can we design better prosthetics for amputees? Can we plan surgery for children with cerebral palsy? OpenSim, freely available computer software re-engineering the way we see movement. Movement comes naturally to most of us. We run, we ride bikes, we walk to work. But diseases that affect our muscles and bones make these simple motions not so simple. OpenSim provides scientists with a platform to understand motion. OpenSim is a software program that lets you create highly accurate models of humans and animals and how they move. For example, we can model running, which requires dozens of muscles in coordination. Each muscle in the body generates a force, pulling the bones it's connected to closer together. As they are activated, other muscles generate different forces. Using what we know about physics, anatomy, and physiology, we calculate all the different forces generated by all the different muscles as they are activated and deactivated at different times. This allows us to simulate and study many motions like walking or running. The goal is to have this common tool that we all use around the world to understand biomechanics of movement and to improve treatments for individuals who have physical disabilities. Cerebral palsy is caused by an injury to the brain that occurs near the time of birth. This injury to the brain will cause problems with movement, coordination, and walking as the child grows up. Many children walk with a crouch gait, showing too much knee flexion or bending. This pattern of walking is inefficient and can lead to joint pain and degeneration over time. The hamstrings are the large group of muscles in the back of your thigh. In children with cerebral palsy, they often become contracted or too tight. One common treatment is a surgery to lengthen the hamstrings. This helps many children walk with a more efficient, upright posture. It's difficult to figure out who will get better and who won't just by watching a patient walk. Here in our gate lab, we do use hamstrings, muscle lengths, and velocities to help us make decisions about who should have a hamstrings lengthening surgery as part of the treatment for their crouch gait. A doctor can use a computer model to determine the length of a patient's hamstrings. This patient has hamstrings that are much shorter than normal when he walks, so he's a good candidate for surgery. After surgery, we see that indeed the patient is walking with a much more upright posture. So our end goal after any treatment, whether it's surgery or therapy, is to help these kids walk better so that they can play with their peers, so that they can run around the schoolyard at the end of the day. Planning treatment for children with cerebral palsy is just one of the many applications of OpenSim. In Chicago, researchers are using modeling to help patients with spinal cord injuries regain the ability to reach and pick up a pencil. In California and Florida, we're learning about how knee joint loads might cause osteoarthritis. In London, simulations are being created to explore how a Tyrannosaurus Rex was able to run. And in Italy, engineers are using OpenSim to design better robots. OpenSim, freely available software re-engineering the way we see movement. Visit opensim.stanford.edu today to learn how you can join the OpenSim community. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, we thought that video was actually a really nice way to kind of begin to wrap our session because it kind of encompassed a little bit of everything that we talked about, even starting with this morning's session. Um, before I completely wrap, I just want to note, I got this wrong moments ago, and so in the interest of full correction, I, I think I mentioned, I think I said the University of California, San Diego, and I meant to say the University of Southern California, so uh, for, for those of you who might be interested in uh, sports biomechanics, and, uh, and um, I just wanted to point out that our, our alumnus, Harper Stewart, who, who graduated in 20, 2018, um, and actually she did some research with me and did some research with a faculty member in mechanical engineering before going on to, uh, to USC. But I just wanted to point out that I think I mentioned the wrong, uh, the wrong lab and program that she's involved in. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do now was just uh, uh, thank you all for attending our session this afternoon. 
uh, for your time. We appreciate the time that everybody spent with us, both from 11 to, uh, to 12, and then again from 1 to 2 here um, on the East Coast. And uh, I know that uh, all three of us, uh, Professor Ebenstein, Professor Wheatley, and myself, we'd be happy to stick around. If, if anybody has any further questions um, and you want to stick around, um, feel free to drop some questions in the chat and we'll try and answer them. And then, uh, and also if you want to, um, if you want to ask your question, if it's more efficient to just unmute yourself and ask, we'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has. Um, once again, we just really appreciate your time and thank you for joining us uh, today and this week for, uh, for our virtual engineering camp. So uh, thanks again. <laughs>